Good morning. Um, this is the uh, Janela Embo Bioemission Seminar Series. On Janela's side, we're now going to do a hybrid with this meeting. Um, so Courtney uh, did start a presentation last December, and this is a, an encore presentation of sorts due to uh, technical difficulties. Um, Courtney is joining us uh, via TWU and Duke University, um, and she's currently a postdoc in the Harry Schroff. Uh, today, she's presenting um, some work from a dissertation in Kevin Walter's lab at Duke um, on a, a single uh, on high speed 3D tracking um, of a virus cell interaction. So, uh, without further ado, uh, Courtney is going to maybe give a brief summary of what she talked about in December and uh, get on to the grand finale. So, thank, thank you. you again. Thank you. Take it away. So, uh, I often say do it right or do it again. And I, I give a, I, I like to think I gave a great talk last time. I got to the end and I said, any questions? And nobody had questions because uh, there was nobody there. So uh, if you were here a few weeks ago, thank you for coming back uh, because it cut out like right before the good part. And so I actually thought a little bit about what to do about this because I think there are some people here for the first time as well. And so kind of the middle ground approach that I decided to take today is, because it's also been a few weeks, um, I'm gonna do a more abbreviated version. Um, of what you saw. And I'm going to omit some of the gorier details. And if you have questions about those, then I'm happy to talk about it at the end. So that's kind of what I've decided on today. So the basic premise of this work is uh, thinking about viruses. So the textbook picture of virology uh, looks a little bit like this, where the virus uh, infection cycle starts when the virus attaches to the cell and makes entry. And that's the start of it. And then it does everything else after. And that's been studied uh, in a lot of detail by single virus tracking. But we actually wanted to focus on that very first part uh, because what's really missing from, these, from this, this kind of classical perspective is how the virus attaches and gets to the cell in the first place. So the real picture is a little bit more complicated because you have human host defenses uh, that represent these large 3D barriers uh, that are complicated and complex to navigate, and yet the virus persists. So we wanted to study how the virus was able to breach these barriers. Um, and the reason that this has been basically impossible to study at the single virus level is kind of a combination of two factors. One is that this is a very large 3D space, and the virus is not bound in this area, so it's moving rapidly. And so if we kind of look at the classical picture of single particle tracking, it looks something like this. So if you're familiar with tracking, if I say tracking, this picture is kind of what you're going to think of. So you have a cell on a cover slip, you sprinkle in some viruses, and you take some uh, fluorescent images. And because the virus is smaller uh, than the diffraction limit, you get this kind of extended spot that you can localize uh, to a greater pre precision. And you take many of these images over time, and then you, you find the center of each spot and then you link together how they move after the fact. And that forms the basis for your trajectory. And so the, the big theme of this work is that the amount of detail and thus information that can be extracted from these trajectories is only as good as, as fast as you are making these points. And so really speed, uh, temporal resolution is the name of the game here. And so the problem with this kind of very traditional model of tracking is that you only get one localization per frame in 2D and one localization per volume in 3D. And so your temporal resolution is intrinsically linked to the size of your volume, which is linked to the size of your observation window. And so this is all kind of linked together. And so if you want to image over a large 3D area or even a small 3D area, your points become very, very spread out in time and you lose the ability to extract meaningful information from these trajectories. But like even at the single frame level where you're limited really by the exposure time, whatever is, being, whatever is happening between these frame times, I mean, this is true of any sampling, but whatever happens in between is being lost. And so this idea of what is being lost between the frames is something that I'm gonna come back to a little bit later, but you should know that it motivated the development of a new way of tracking called active feedback tracking. And I say new, it's been around for some time, but the idea was to be able to localize particles very rapidly. And these, these, uh, this forward tracking is kind of very different from the picture I showed you previously because the tracking is not done after the fact, it's done in real time. And there are a variety of ways to localize the particle. 
uh, but there are kind of key benefits to doing it this way. And the first is that your volume size is no longer tied to an imaging rate. So you can have, you're now, because the stage is following the particle, you're now limited only to how far you can follow it with the stage. So you can have a larger volume, particularly in Z. So also the big benefit, and you can just see how much more sampled this trajectory is than trajectories you may be familiar with. Um, so because it's faster, you get more detailed trajectories. So, um, but there's a key drawback to all of these methods is that there's no image because you're focusing exclusively on the particle, there is no outside context. And so while these methods have been around for some time and they've been able to get really good um, insight on the dynamics of particles kind of in a vacuum, uh, you lose the ability to do anything more than infer uh, interactions because you have no readout of the thing that it's, the particle is interacting with. So the re there's actually a reason why this hasn't been done before and it's the stage is constantly moving. And so in order to get an image when you're doing active feedback tracking, you need to be able to image while the stage is moving. And this is obviously not a simple thing. So we wanted to be able to see the particle and the cell in high detail. And we wanted to bring the image back to this kind of high speed tracking. And so this motivated us to take a multimodal approach. And the result was 3D trim or 3D tracking and imaging. And so the way this system works, is we have our virus and we have our cell and it's sitting on a heated sample holder on a piezoelectric stage and objective lens that is shared by two chromatically separated uh, micro fluorescence microscope systems. So the first 3D smart is focused entirely on the particle. So we'll track the particle at very high speeds. The second is 3D faster and it is a way that it is an imaging method that can image while the stage is moving. And so I'm gonna talk about this one by one. But the first system I'm gonna talk about is 3D Smart. 3D Smart is a real-time uh, active feedback single particle tracking system that can create richly sampled trajectories over a large 3D range. And so this track is showing successively acquired 100 nanometer uh, microspheres diffusing in water over a large range. Uh, you can see, that, so you can see it kind of diffuse over a 30 micron range here but the actual range is only stage limited. So it's 50 microns that it could. Um, so the one thing I wanna point out is this system is extremely fast um, and it's also really sensitive. In fact, it can track single molecules freely diffusing uh, for minutes at a time. And this was something that was measured in milliseconds uh, previously. Um, in fact, not in a cell. So um, the way the system works is it uses a real-time feedback loop to localize the particle position 50,000 times per second and moves the stage to follow the particle. And so kind of a schematic on how that works is you scan the laser around a small one by one by two micron area that consists of a 25 point grid pattern. And you detect the photon arrivals using a single photon counting detector. And then you use this information of when and where the photons arrived to make an estimate of the particle position. And then you center uh, the particle on that point using the piezo stage. And so kind of what this might look like is you have a 25 point grid, the laser is being scanned around with a pair of electro optic deflectors and an acoustic lens in Z. I'm just showing you 2D view here, but the virus moves and then the stage moves to follow it. And so this kind of small box shifts around to follow the virus and it's continuously localizing it. And that record of its motions is the basis of the trajectory. So again, this is done in real time. This is not something that is done after the fact. There's no camera. Um, this is all point scanning very rapidly. So each of those points on the grid, it's sitting there for 20 microseconds and then making, a, making an update calculation as to where the, where the center is now. So we had a really fast tracking, but on its own, again, it's, it's special in that it is very fast. It's faster than the other methods and it's more sensitive than the other methods. But on its own, there was no image. So the way we decided to get an image was 3D faster. And so basically what 3D faster is, is it's a two photon volumetric point scan imaging system uh, in 3D. And so what was interesting about this is that if I tell you this information that we needed, that we used two photon laser scanning microscopy because we needed to be faster than the stage, that probably sounds really weird um, if you're familiar uh, with two photon um, because the stage, uh, moves 
at about one millisecond lag time. And the frame time in two photon microscopy is one second. So this actually seems to be a pretty bad mismatch in the other direction. And that would be true if we considered uh, images on the frame basis. But instead of considering images on the frame basis, if we consider them on the voxel basis, the pixel uh, dwell time in a two photon point scanning microscope is only one microsecond. And so if we register these voxels on that time scale instead, that actually allows us to avoid the motion blur and enables us to image while the stage is moving. The other obstacle that we had to overcome though was how to get 3D imaging. So we overcome our uh, obstacle to image while the stage is moving, but we needed 3D imaging. So normally this is done using a stage and moving the sample and we couldn't do that. Um, so we had to come up with an alternative. Uh, and so what I found was that if you attach an electrically tunable lens, uh, the normal, so what I'm showing you on the left here is kind of a normal Z stack pattern. So the, the color is basically the frame time, the number of frames that have been scanned at this point. And a Z stack scans one frame at a time. And so there's basically, so this is showing a 16 plane example volume. Theoretically, there is a 15 second time gap between the bottom of that volume and the top of the volume. And so what I found is if you take an electrically tunable lens and just let it scan continuously in a triangle wave pattern while the 2D frame scan is running, you actually create these triangular patterns throughout the YZ axis. And I had this crazy conspiracy idea um, that they could tessellate. And it turned out that they could. And so the advantage of this is that you're scanning continuously throughout the whole volume. So there's no longer this 15 second time lag. Every plane in the volume gets scanned every single frame and the pattern will step. And this is a controllable and reproducible pattern that's based completely on the ratio between the two frequencies, the frequency of the ETL and the frequency of the 2D frame scan. And so the benefit of doing that is that there, there are kind of two benefits. The first is that because you're more evenly, you don't actually need to acquire all of the pixels. You can interpolate. The second is that because you're not relying on every single frame uh, to be imaged, you actually have a variable ac acquisition time. You can choose at what point your volume reaches the image quality after interpolation that you want. And that was really critical for us um, in a sense with trim because the stage is moving. And so this pattern actually becomes a little bit more randomized when we're doing it for trim. This method actually stands alone uh, to image faster using a point scan method. And so just to kind of show you how this works, uh, I'm gonna show you a video of this uh, scan in real time. So the first column here is basically the raw image. And the pink uh, magenta is color coded and it's just a voxel that has not been scanned and it has no nearest neighbors. The blue is a voxel that has not been scanned but it has at least one nearest neighbor. And then the, and the actual image intensity will fill in as it scans. And then this is gonna be the corresponding uh, slice after it's been interpolated, which will occur after the first frame is complete. And then this column is gonna be the 3D renders. Uh, the top is the volume render. And I'm just gonna spoiler this and say it's not gonna change after frame two at all. Um, like if you look closely, you know it's updating, but it's, it's, there are no real changes. And then the voxel map, as I call it, is a map of the nearest neighbors. And then the fill is just a, a measure of how many voxels out of the whole volume have been scanned. And so what's gonna happen here is I'm gonna stop the, uh, I'm gonna start the video. All right, so didn't quite stop where I wanted to. Um, let's see if I can't control this. No, sorry, I don't know why it's being a little laggy. So still a little more. So right now we have scanned uh, for only uh, one second and we can kind of see how the voxels are still distributed out. So there's considerably less continuous areas of pink in the raw frame. Um, the volume render again is not gonna change in any significant way. This is a little bit coarser than I would say uh, want it to be. So I'll just let it play through. This is gonna get sharper. The interpolated image is gonna get sharper as it continues to scan. But the gross morphology is not gonna change. I don't know why this is jumping around, sorry.
So the image is just going to get sharper, but the volume render is not going to change. And so the idea is that if you really want sharp images, you can wait a little bit longer and you can still get a four times speed up over conventional uh, point scan 3D imaging. But if you just need the volume render, if you just need the kind of coarser morphology, you can get basically an eight times increase uh, or more depending on the number of uh, planes in your image. So this was, a, this was a method that actually turned out to be its own standalone thing, uh, but it was actually perfect for what we needed for 3D trim. So now we have our tracking, we have our imaging, we're gonna put them together. So when we have the tracking and imaging together, there are kind of two ways uh, we could think about this on a registration basis. So the first one I'm showing you on the left is what I call the local frame space. So this is actually what it would look like if you were viewing the image um, as a time series per frame. Um, but what, what you're gonna see is there's a blue dot in the middle and this represents the location of the tracking volume in the image. So this is basically where the virus is uh, in relationship to the imaging system. And the, the boundary of the local frame is green. And so you can kind of see at the top, there is some striping in intensity um, of the cell. And so the reason why is the ETL is scanning different focal planes. So each line, uh, depending on the frequency, is a different focal plane. So what's, what's going to change, though, is when the virus moves around, you're going to see the cells move around in the image, in the local image space. On the right, I'm showing you the global image space. So because we know the, the pixel number in the image and where it's, what depth is that and where the stage is, we can register these voxels to an absolute position. So on the right, basically you're gonna see the, the location of the local image frame that's bounded, bounded in green kind of move around. And as I start to play it, it's a maximum intensity projection. So it's gonna get brighter, but what's gonna happen is basically the frame is gonna move around, but the cells, cells on the right are gonna stay in position. And so this is how we can kind of trace out this map of the cell. And so the, the size of the image is gonna vary based on how far uh, the virus moves. So, the, so basically, if you were just looking at this on a per frame basis on the left, you would see the cells move around, uh, but the absolute global space is kind of fixed. And so basically this, this goes until, the until we either lose the ability to track the virus because it's out of the bounds of our stage um, or bleaches, but basically, we collect all of this image data on the right. And because we have variable uh, flexibility in how we acquire it, uh, we can, not sure where the images went, but we can basically make a time series out of them or we can make it into one uh, 40 volume of the whole trajectory. And we can basically make a render of that image and overlay the trajectory. And this is what a 3D trim data set looks like. And one of the nice things about this data is that we can tie it together in a way that's quantitative. So we can look at each of the voxels in the image and we can calculate the distance to the nearest uh, point on the trajectory. And we can use this to form distance maps. And so uh, I'm gonna show a, an image like this in a second, but basically any of the blue is uh, basically the virus did not come within one micron. The orange, the virus came between 500 nanometers and one micron. And then the red is what we call our contact threshold. Uh, and it's actually hard to see for that reason because the trajectory is right on top of it. But this is basically our, uh, where the virus came within 500 nanometers or kind of one voxel in Z. And so this is what these maps will look like when I show them. So before I go any further today, I have to give a big shout out to my partner in crime, uh, Jack Exel who built the model virus that we're using today. So this was a VSVG pseudotype particle that had EGFP uh, attached to VPR inside the caps. And this was important to us for two reasons. So the first is that we're gonna be looking at surface interactions. And so we wanted to make sure the label was not perturbing the surface. Um, the other thing that's kind of, un, uh, kind of hidden in this information, um, EGFP is very dim compared to organic dyes, for example. And so a lot of other existing active feedback tracking system requires a much brighter particle um, than this. And so this was really a testament to the sensitivity of our system that we were able to um, track this particle. So 
without any further, I'm gonna get to the good stuff now, which is uh, our actual 3D trim data. So the first thing I'm gonna talk about is a behavior that we called skimming. And when I say that we called it skimming, okay, I'm gonna try this again. Okay, let's come up. Okay, I don't know why the videos are being weird today. They worked last night. Um, basically, I have to check my power settings. Uh, I'm gonna open this just to be redundant. Okay, power coins crash. Sorry, about that. at least it's somebody else's Zoom. I'm gonna check my power settings here. It's on best performance, okay. I'm gonna go to the older one. So I'll basically tell you about skimming all this loads. Um, basically we had to come up with a name for this behavior because it didn't exist. Um, skimming is basically where the virus is making intermittent contacts with the cell. Let's see if this works now, please work. I've never had this happen, I promise. Oh, so basically the virus is making intermittent contacts with the cell. Um, and this is a behavior that was not able to be observed uh, because it was being lost between the frames because these uh, contacts were on the millisecond basis if they were playing. Um, and basically just from even this, you can kind of see the difference in sampling and temporal resolution. Uh, between what we had with 3D trim and what we would have if we tried to replicate this, exper this experiment on a spinning disc and focal. Um, sorry, you can't see that, but basically the virus hops around and makes intermittent contacts with the cell. And what's interesting about this is without our kind of combination of temporal resolution, it, you know, milliseconds contact with 3D imaging to know that the cell is actually being touched you just couldn't see this behavior before. And apparently we still can't see it. Um, let's see if this one works. So this is a, this, this behavior that we observed, the ball is gonna turn green every time it's making these contacts. Um, this behavior is not actually uh, mutually exclusive with kind of conventional picture of binding. So these cells are kind of taller HeLa cells versus what we were just looking at um, were fibroblast cells, but basically the virus does this kind of skimming behavior as it's, you know, we like to kind of anthropomorphize and say, you know, the virus is searching for a receptor, but I mean, this is all random to some extent, uh, but basically the difference is, so the virus has made a lot of skimming contacts, um, but what it's going to happen as it comes back around this time is the virus is actually going to make uh, contact with the cell and bind. And so one of the key differences I want to point out here is that the difference between skimming and binding is speed. So one of the reasons why skimming is hard to detect is because it doesn't really result in a change in diffusivity compared to binding. Binding is very dramatic because the mobility, the speed changes, uh, but with skimming, it does not. Um, and one of the interesting things that we found with this behavior um, was that with these HeLa cells, we saw a kind of greater distribution in these diffusivities compared to when we were using two different lines of fibroblast cells. And what was interesting about this um, was the two fiber, the difference between these fibroblast cells was that um, the GM701 cells were chosen because they did not have the receptor for this virus, uh, the LDLR, uh, whereas the BJ did. And we didn't really see a difference at all, um, but with HeLa, we saw a dramatic difference. And so we attribute this to the morphology of the cell kind of influencing how it's able uh, to move which will kind of come back later. Um, By morphology, you just mean it's taller? Yes, shape. It's, it's not flat, it's curved. So this is another trajectory where the virus is bound. And here it's labeled uh, by diffusivity, color-coded. Um, so what we actually missed the initial binding event this time, but it's actually bound between these two fibers. And what's interesting about this trajectory is we're actually gonna see it leave and basically escape from being bound to freely diffusing again. 
And then it's actually gonna contact and bind again. And this is a much shorter event. And then it will diffuse away again. And so one of the things that there, there are a couple of things that I really love uh, about this trajectory to talk about that kind of show off the strengths of this method. So the first, so the first thing I really like about this is um, if you wanted to kind of get this kind of binding information, you could in theory do it with a method like TERF. This is how this would be conventionally done. And you could measure things like resonance times. Uh, but because this virus detaches and binds again, this type of method would actually see this as being two different viruses. It wouldn't know that it was the same virus. And so it kind of demonstrates the ability for this method to give an uninterrupted timeline of a single virus. Uh, the other thing is that it really is a testament to our level of 3D detail. Um, it turns out in that first binding site, it actually is bound inside that groove. And the reason I feel extra confident in saying this is because the Z position of our tracked particle also agrees with this and shows that it's 500 nanometers lower than the second position. And so uh, it was really cool to see that. So one of the other things um, about the level of 3D detail is I'm gonna show you kind of different type of binding now. So this time when the virus uh, binds to the cell, it's actually gonna attach uh, to a part of the cell that isn't labeled in this particular um, experiment. And what's really cool about this is because of the high spatial and temporal precision of our tracking, it's actually gonna kind of act as a super resolution imaging element as it traces out uh, the protrusion that it's bound to. And so uh, even though this feature isn't labeled itself, if it were labeled, you wouldn't really be able to see it because it would be about one voxel in size. But as the virus moves around it, you can actually see it trace out the structure leaving a hollow core. Um, and so if we kind of look at this, we can see that the structure is um, about 100 nanometers in radius, and it's well below uh, the diffraction limit along the both major axes. Um, and so this is just a really cool example of how this can be uh, used as kind of to see, to super resolve really smaller elements of the cell. Um, and actually the way we get this information is we can use this trajectory information and fit it to a cylinder. That's how we measure these things. Um, and actually we can see these things kind of move over time in a way. Um, this is another trajectory. So this was not something that we just saw once that I'm showing it to you. This is something we saw several times. Um, so what's interesting about this one is the color coding is based on time. And you could actually see how the angle of the structure changes over time. It goes um, from being one angle and then it changes the angle in the yellow part at the end. And so that's kind of like what those cylinder fits uh, look like. And what's actually interesting about this trajectory is this is another one where it detaches kind of halfway through the trajectory and then comes uh, back. And then we also saw kind of where it actually traces out the traces out spheres. And you can kind of slice the render hollow to look through it and see how it conforms. And so again, this is just a way to look at, so this is something that is slow enough that you could absolutely track it with a conventional um, tracking method for sure. But you don't get this level of detail and imaging uh, with the sampling that you have on these conventional systems. So it's showing off a way that 3D trim can give unique capabilities. And uh, the next thing is not so much a unique capability, it's just we kept being asked about it. And the question was, can you track inside cells? And the answer is yes. So if we can slice through this render, we can see that the trajectory is embedded inside. Um, so we can track a little bit longer because there's no way the virus is gonna escape our uh, stage. Uh, we're really only limited by photo bleaching here. And we certainly do get the trajectories in more detail. Um, but again, this is not a super unique capability. It's just showing that you absolutely can track inside cells. So yeah, it's just showing you that the trajectory is firmly inside and the route that it traced along the other axis. Uh, so one other thing that we did was uh, because the stage serves as a common frame of reference, we can actually co-register uh, co many of these trajectories together. So this is one of the drawbacks of any single uh, active feedback method is that you can only track one particle at a time. And so one of the things that we did though, is we looked at some uh, successive trajectories and my undergraduate, uh, Jonathan, uh, worked really hard to kind of visualize these all together. 
And what was important about that was it enables us to extract trends from the data. So we can see, uh, we, we looked at 27 trajectories over 35 minutes. And so one of the things I wanna talk about here though is it's kind of notable, right? Cause we're imaging this area for 35 minutes. And we looked at the first volume and the last volume and there was basically hardly any bleaching that you would expect to see. And the reason why that, that happens, if you, if you just sit on the surface of these cells and image them for 35 minutes, you will absolutely bleach them. But because we're constantly moving around and sampling new areas, we don't really experience the, the, the level of bleaching that you would when you're imaging a static area. And so we were able to image these over a period of 35 minutes and track for 35 minutes and 27 trajectories. And you know, one of the really interesting things that happened to us was we had two particles that bound and they bound almost next to each other. And it was like 10 minutes apart. Um, and you can also see trends um, in the diffusivity, which is color coded um, and the speed kind of slows down near some of the cells uh, on the right side. And again, on a common cell, you didn't really see that with the others, um, but also you don't really see that in free space. So it's a way to extract trends from single particle active feedback data. And finally, I'm gonna circle back to the, to, the, to the main plot here, which is how are viruses able to penetrate the epithelium? So again, the epithelium is kind of an extended layer. Um, it has a lot of uh, ways that particles can get trapped. And so we wanted to understand how the virus moves in this kind of different environment compared to cells on a cover slip. And so I think this method originated in Jennifer's lab actually. Um, but basically we have this porous uh, matrix support for HT29 MTX cells. And basically we can invert this filter so that it fits in our sample chamber so this is kind of a different geometry. So in this case, uh, the cells which kind of grow on the top of this filter, when you stick it upside down, they're gonna be kind of hanging from uh, those cells, or sorry, the cells are gonna be hanging from the filter. So instead of um, the, the virus coming from above to cells on a cover slip, the virus is gonna be swimming from below. So you can already see uh, how different and Oh, come on, you gotta play this one. This is the one video that has to work, come on. Here we go. So the virus, so this is a much more complicated environment. And right now I'm drawing the video as it scans in. So it's more of kind of a real time uh, display of the accumulative image. And so the behavior of the virus is dramatically different in this environment. So it's running into places that it's contacting everywhere. Um, but it's also moving really rapidly. It's not, it's not moving like a bound particle or an internalized particle. Um, so the virus is moving really fast over a large 3D area. This is not something that you would be able to track with another microscope. And I have to shout out um, Yushin Lin, who's the grad student here who made all of the amazing cinematography. Um, but basically it's a very dramatically uh, different environment. So if we kind of look at this from a static perspective, this is a much more complicated and messy environment compared to uh, the HeLa cells or even the fibroblasts. Um, and you can actually see how the virus is kind of hugging the cell in this, in this kind of sense. It's very confined. And you can actually see this when you look at the distance map, um, the, the density of these contacts is much closer together. And the big thing that I wanna talk about here is just because it's confined does not mean it's slow. This is, so this is something that's moving over a 10 micron range um, and it's moving at an average of almost one micron square per second, um, or I should say 0 0.75. And what's interesting, the, the other thing I wanna shout out here is with a more, uh, with more traditional tracking system, you only have enough sample points that you can extract one diffusion coefficient generally. Um, particularly in these types of environments where it's uh, faster. But because we have so much information, so we have a thousand samples per second, we can actually separate out and detect when these changes in diffusion are occurring. Um, and so that's how you can color code it based on diffusivity, and how that speed is changing as it interacts with the environment. And to compare what this would look like, um, we didn't have the same sample, but we kind of 
uh, simulated it using basically uh, the level of glycerol that would give us basically that diffusion coefficient. And you can see the difference in sampling at that speed um, when the range is taken into account. Um, so you would not get this level of detail with any other system. Um, so that is to say, this was kind of our first demonstration of the power of 3D trim. And we're really excited about the future. Like any good movie, it is time to roll the credits. Um, I have to thank my entire lab, particularly my emerging superstar, recently tenured associate professor, Kevin Welsher, and the trim squad, Yushin, Jack, and Jonathan, who are with me 100% of the way. It's really awesome to be part of a team that was just totally committed to this. Um, and it's awesome to see the reception that it's been getting. I'm sorry the videos just were not cooperating today. Um, now, if people are still out there on Zoom, I will take your questions. Do I need to stop sharing or? Um, sure. How do I do that? I don't want to disconnect from the meeting and press the <laughs> wrong button. <laughs> CJ, I have a question. Yes. How come you don't see a difference between cells that have and don't have the, the receptor for the virus in terms of diffusivity? So we if took, I got that right. Yes, yes. So that was a surprise to us too. That's literally why we did that experiment was because our hypothesis was that we would. So our hypothesis then was that these kind of changes in diffusion were not being influenced by the presence of the receptor and that skimming is not necessarily a receptor-based interaction. So binding is a receptor-based interaction, but clearly skimming is more influenced by the morphology, kind of given what you saw with HeLa versus both of those controlled fiberglass lines. And the, and the, but the binding is, you saw, wait, do you ever see binding in the non? Like, does things stop? I don't have any of those to show you, <laughs> put it that way. Yeah, Got so we, we definitely saw binding in the one. So the HeLa does have the receptor. We did see binding in the BJ. It was a little bit rarer uh, than we expected, but yeah. Got it. Thanks. Looks like Robert has a question on Zoom. Hi, Robert. Hi, CJ. Fantastic presentation. Um, I'm really glad we, we had a chance to watch it again. We would have um, missed so much of it. Um, maybe I, I wanted to ask a more technical question at the beginning, and then maybe I have a, a biology question following up on that. So you might have said it, but maybe I missed it. So what is what is really your precision in the localization that you get, and what are what is it? What are the factors that actually experimentally influence it in 3D? Right, like sort of what is your precision x, y yep. versus z? And that's a great that's a great question. And how so, does it compare to your you know sort of the basically the trajectories that you that you draw? Yeah, that's that's a great question, um, and that's one of the reasons I was really happy to give this talk here is for more technical questions like this. So the localization precision scales with the number of photons. Mm -hmm. So the brighter the particle. Uh, the, the higher your localization precision. So our precision is a little bit lower because we're using the EGFP. So we were down to about 180 um, and a little bit worse in uh, Z. But basically, like if we had a brighter particle, we could get um, anywhere from, so I think the original paper for this tracking method reported like 80 nanometers, for example. Mm -hmm. um, but but in, set, in set, is it similar to X and Y? Because I would imagine in set, it's, yeah, it's a little worse than yeah. Z, absolutely. Um, but yeah, again, and, and also it's going to get worse over the course of the trajectory due to photo bleaching. So it's not like a constant. So it, it depends. So it will, it will. <laughs> so it's one of the other things to note, though, is that number is, is smaller than the image pixel size. So that's one of the reasons that we also okay. feel confident with localizing mm -hmm. these two together. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Yeah, and then maybe just a Quick follow-up question on more biology related. So you, yeah, you said you label the viruses with um, EGFP, and I don't know how how many sort of copies you have on your virus, but does that in some way sort of influence the um, the kinetics or you know what you call you know the diffusivity of it? Does it? Yeah, that, that's a that's a great question. Um, so the best way that I can answer it. So in the paper we did we did do a photo bleaching study of this to try and figure out how many uh, EGFPs so, because we did have a range of intensities. Mm -hmm. uh, that we observed. Um, I don't know if we can definitively say that it didn't influence, but um, given that we have kind of a type distribution, I would say it's relevant. Okay, cool. I think the yeah. number we had was, it was a pretty wide range of GFPs. It was 2,200, um, but we were, we were aiming for like the lower side 
if that makes sense, like there were the distribution was there were more that were towards 20 than 200. That was kind of like the range. No, thanks. Yeah, I'll definitely also check out the paper in what the for sure. Thank you for coming back, by the way. Uh, Brian, did you have a question? It was sort of a follow up to Robert um, about a number of GFPs. Uh, could you, in principle, track one eGFP if you sample slower, or what? What is sort of a limit on on how how many uh, how many photons do you really need for this technique? Yeah, that's a really good. That that's an excellent question because we can track single molecules uh, in solution. Now that's different than tracking single molecules in cells. So. The reason why is because of things like autofluorescence and other background contributors. Um, and just the fact that you lose photons at depth, um, there are no like adaptive optics implemented in this anywhere or anything. So, um, so you do need more photons than you would just tracking in. Um, I, I would say, so we were getting about 2000 photons per eGFP. Um, and if I recall correctly, the single molecule paper that our, our lab did was they were using an ADO 647 at, I think they were getting 8,000 counts per second. Um, so, so that would, I think that would be, I would say the minimum, like just in a vacuum. But so we would need like four GFPs to match that, but then we would have to deal. So one of the things that our group is working on is ways to more efficiently localize the particle and to kind of beat this background. Uh, Cause that is our goal is to eventually track single molecules, um, you know, interacting with cells. So. So that's definitely a huge area of interest for the lab to be able to implement it in the system. So cool, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I guess one more question for me. Uh, I didn't really see a lot of motion from the cells. And I think this might be just time scale separation between the virus and the- uh... It was so angry. Luckily, this is why one angry point was because we actually, when we did the 3D faster paper, uh, we had labeled these uh, vesicles. That we, we just kind of did like RFP throughout and we showed that we could act, we absolutely did have the ability to view, um, you know, 40, do 40 imaging with 3D faster. And for whatever reason, uh, be it the time scale or what was labeled, uh, we just did not see movement and it was infuriating. And so I'm hoping, you know, the studies that they do carrying on the system next find a way to kind of uh, label the cells in motion um, to be able to capture uh, more of that and have that benefit because absolutely, you know, that's the benefit of real time imaging. Um, but we just were not seeing it. And it was very unfortunate because we knew that the cells were totally viable because we saw the internalized trafficking and things like that. Um, so we knew that they weren't like dead or anything. We just could not, whatever we labeled in the time scale, we didn't see it. Um, is there any way to track more than one protocol? Is, That's a great can you, question. Can you envision it? Is can I envision it? So like, yeah, this is something that we've kind of uh, thought about because uh, that would be great. Um, you know, the thing is, because the stage is moving to follow the particle, unless you jump between multiple particles, uh, you would you could only follow one. And so, you know, if you do the jumping between particle things, and I think there, were, there was a paper recently that's been trying to do that, um, you're dividing your temporal resolution. So you're losing some of the benefit. You know, at a certain point, you know, the, the benefit of a camera is that it's highly parallelized. But if you want the fastest possible output of a single particle, this is how you would do it. I don't think there's a, if in this had, setup. If you had a camera that had enough, I don't know, I've seen some chips that claiming to have photon counting pixels. I'm really interested in these like kind of spat arrays that are coming out. Like yeah. I, I think there's kind of like a recent five by five spat array. I was like, this is perfect. <laughs> Like I could see that gives you a 25 X increase in temporal resolution, right? I'm not sure if you could do it that way or how, like, I think you could parallelize just this algorithm, but like that would possibly be a way that you could do it. Um, like, I think maybe in the future, there will be some kind of technology like that, that enables it. Um, but like the way this is set up with a stage moving, like if you get rid of the stage moving, the stage is the limiting factor. Cause we localized the particle 50,000 times per second. Like the stage is why we only, use a thousand points because that's the limiting factor here. So like if you can get around that, like it opens new possibilities even for speed. So 